knows a lot about all kinds of stuff, Professor Dave explains. As promised in the introduction to this series, we will focus not only on philosophy, but also logic and how it emerged and evolved over time to become what it is today. Logic arose as a proper school of thought with Plato's pupil Aristotle by the 4th century BCE, but it didn't simply manifest overnight. Much like philosophy and science themselves, logic evolved gradually from persistent attempts to improve discourse toward having more objective, analyzable methods. In this tutorial, we'll examine these early steps taken by ancient thinkers, which paved the way for the establishment of what would become modern logic. As we recall, an argument is composed of premises which result in a conclusion. The simple example we looked at earlier is a very straightforward argument, and if we change the nouns into letters, we can begin to see how this simple argument can be equivalent to a formula, with every word having a function. All denotes every member of a category, in this case, YouTubers. Are and is indicate a connection between the first category and the second. However, not necessarily the opposite, as for example, not all mortals are YouTubers. What we establish with this argument, then, is a relationship between certain categories, such as YouTubers and mortals, and how a member of one of those categories, Dave, is therefore a member of the other. Changing these words while maintaining the same format would still be valid, as with the classic all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal. We could even alter these operating words, all to some, is to is not, and so forth, and we would get different kinds of arguments. This basic format is what Aristotle would call a syllogism, but some of its early elements can be identified millennia before him. The earliest source we have on formulating some kind of logical operators are the Babylonians, specifically with the Sumerians and Akkadians in Mesopotamia. Instead of introducing them in an analysis of discourse, such as philosophy or science, for example, they were developed as part of their codes of law and jurisprudence, especially the Ur-Namu, circa 2047 to 2030 BCE. The Lipit Ishtar, circa 1900 to 1850 BCE, and the Hammurabi, 1728 to 1686 BCE. They would be publicly written in slabs or walls, and they contained basic operators, such as or, and, if then, much like premises. When the judges needed to evaluate given facts, then an inference would occur toward a verdict or a conclusion. The basic shape would be. If crime, then punishment, which would be the code of law, a crime occurred, the fact requiring judgment, then punishment, the verdict or conclusion. These codes directly influenced the Greek law in which Aristotle lived centuries later, potentially influencing his ideas. On the other hand, although Confucius preceded Aristotle by a couple centuries, not much of Chinese philosophy seems to have reached Greece by his time. As we already saw, Confucius and his predecessors centered their philosophical perspectives around language, or more specifically on names, or Ming, and their relationships with all the things they designate. In his Analects, when asked what his first priority would be when administrating the state, he said that it would be to focus on the proper use of names, or ordering of names, Cheng Ming, as their misuse would generate an incongruity between actions, rituals, songs, law, and the people, and thus result in chaos and immorality. However, Confucius never delved further on proper linguistic analysis. This endeavor was only undertaken by the Moists some two centuries later. Although their surviving text fragments are limited, much has been extrapolated to compare their development with Aristotle, and even more modern notions and concepts. One example is one of their techniques of disputation called parallelizing, which generated arguments resembling syllogisms, such as... Dave is a YouTuber. Befriending Dave is befriending a YouTuber. To assert comparatively if this statement is correct, more statements would be fashioned in the same shape, such as YouTube is a website. To visit YouTube is to visit a website. And so on. Although simple, their logical format and its importance in evaluating an argument is evident. 
even though their focus was on the semantic aspect, or its contents, more so than on the format itself. Near China, Indian logic purportedly began around the 5th century BCE, but the only written evidence dates from around 300 years later, with the previously mentioned books focused on argumentation and rhetorical analysis. The Kata Vatu, or Points of Controversy, attributed to Magaliputta Tissa, is interesting as an underlying format can be seen in the points of discussion between a defender of a Buddhist school of thought and an attacker of their values. Adapting the subject to our current context, this would be an example. Defender. Is Dave a YouTuber? Attacker. Yes. Defender. Is Dave a YouTuber like any other YouTuber? No. Acknowledge your refutation. If Dave is a YouTuber, then he is a YouTuber like any other YouTuber. What you say here is wrong, namely that we ought to say that Dave is a YouTuber, but we ought not say that he is a YouTuber like any other YouTuber. If we deny the latter statement, indeed the former should not be admitted. It is wrong to affirm the former statement while denying the latter. Although not explicit, its shape clearly plays an important role to the validity of their argumentations, as you can interchange nouns or names and keep its format, as it happens frequently in this work. Defender, is A, B? Attacker, yes. Is C, D? No. Acknowledge your refutation. If A is B, then C is D. What you say here is wrong, namely that A is B, but that C is not D. If C is not D, then A is not B. It is wrong that A is B and C is not D. Further developments in the first five centuries of the Common Era helped improve syllogisms in India toward more simple and effective formats such as this. Proposition, X has Y. Reason, because X has Z. Relation, a relation which possessors of Z bear to possessors of Y. This developed especially with the Nyaya Sutra, or Aphorisms on Logic, of the Nyaya school, and its illustrated successor, Karaka Samhita, or Karaka's Collection, culminating around the 5th century CE with the Buddhist thinker Dignaga and his successors. Dignaga standardized logical practices for much of posterior Buddhist philosophical inquiry, ascribing a great deal of importance to parallel examples, as in Chinese logic. One example would be this. Proposition, X has Y. Reason, because P has Z. Example, that which has Z has Y, like D, where D, distinct from P, has properties Z and Y. This is a clear deductive syllogism, meaning that it is characterized by or based on the inference of particular instances from a general law, with an explicit focus on its format and method of applicability. This is in contrast with an accidental use of the syllogistic shape like many of our previous examples. He also developed advanced notions regarding surrounding concepts and even a truth table. Although these developments were almost a millennium after Aristotle, nowadays it is recognized that a few Indian elements were more advanced than their Greek counterparts, having even influenced recent mathematicians and logicians, such as George Boole, creator of Boolean operators in the 19th century. Finally, the pre-Socratics also hinted at some early logical elements. The Sophists, as well as Diogenes Laertius and Alcidamus, categorized sentences relative to their argumentative force, while Antisthenes identified a truthful sentence as corresponding with the real world. An authorless text called Disoi Logoi, or Double Arguments, from around 400 BCE, is possibly the earliest fragment on truth and falsity. Zeno and Socrates, as we saw, were also known for deliberately fallacious methods, however never explicitly aware of this format. Plato's formal categorization of this method as a dialectical argument was also in a manner akin to a prototypical logical analysis. In the sophist dialogues, he likewise performs a linguistic analysis of simple statements and differentiates between their form, or syntax, and their truthfulness, or semantics. Thus, a statement can only be valid when it is successful in specifying a subject and saying something about it, a crucial separation within logic. 
Further logical terminology is developed both in his Euthydemus dialogues and with Eubulides, as they analyze several paradoxes and fallacies, with Plato further focusing on the differences of valid and invalid arguments. Most of these early developments, in addition to the ways that proof and deduction were being developed in Greek mathematics by the 5th century BCE, converged into Aristotle's official development of logic. In the next tutorial, we will take a look at his general theory, followed by a more in-depth dive into how he defined logic for millennia to come. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.